Hey, uh, my name is Nick Earls, I'm a business partner at Prime here at Tia Cola. Thanks, Todd, for inviting us to speak here. Uh, we own the Winter Spring Capital and PW Young Development. We've been in business since 2015. Uh, mostly been doing new construction projects, some renovations as well, all throughout uh, greater Boston. Mostly in Boston, but some of the surrounding towns as well. So kind of today we're just going to give like an overview of the development process. You can apply this to any size from a single family foot to you know, 150 units, condos, apartments. We kind of focus on condos, but the same process can be applied. So just a simple question, what is real estate development and why do people, why would you pursue real estate development to, as opposed to just buying a rental property or you know, what you might be more familiar with? So real estate development, commonly defined as bringing a property to its best and highest use. You're finding a property where it's more appropriate for, typically for it to be more dense, densely developed than it already is. You might have raw land or you might have a smaller property where a larger property could go. It also often includes a use change. You might have a commercial property that becomes a mixed use property with a commercial component but also a residential component. Um, or might simply go from, you know, a commercial property to a straight multifamily property. But you're taking a parcel of land and finding a better use for it, more or less, and adding a lot of value in the process. Um, and I, actually, before we uh, switch slides, I just wanted to mention, why would you go for development as opposed to just buying a, a rental property? But the answer is simple is that Similar to what Leslie was mentioning about barriers to entry and going after things that most people would run away from, they might not feel capable of doing, you can make higher returns in development than other forms of real estate investment because of those barriers to entry. It's a harder thing to do. You're creating more value. So that's why real estate investment, whether you're a passive investor or you're a developer yourself, um, might be an attractive option. So this is a, just a good analogy. Um, to a developer as a movie producer, just a helpful way to understand. A lot of times when we, you think of developers, or at least I did when I was growing up, I thought of construction. Um, but really the developer is the one who's pulling all the pieces together. They're setting up the team. They're getting the funding together to create the project. They have the vision of what's going to end up happening at the end. They might have a construction component to their company, but that's entirely unnecessary. A lot of times you'll be hiring a general contractor and that's what we do on our projects. <clears throat> so this slide, we just want to go through kind of the broad stroke steps of development. Um, and we'll go a little more granular on each point. But the first piece of development is really an idea. Now the idea that you start with might not be the finished product that you end up with. But if you want to say you decided, okay, I want to develop townhouses or single family houses in you know, Waltham or Lexington or Newton, you start with an idea like that because that informs how you're going to behave thereafter. So maybe you had a, that idea that you're going to develop single family houses around this area. Well, what would you do once you had that idea? That would inform the next step of acquiring a property that fits your idea. So maybe you had that idea for single family houses, but what would you want to do? You'd want to speak with brokers, real estate agents, who work in land sales, where you could develop a single family house in the markets that you're trying to develop in. And you'll also be approaching, you could be approaching property owners off market, which I recommend if you want to do development. You can get a lot of good deals that way. You have mailer lists of specific neighborhoods that you're interested in developing in. You can do cold calls. But that idea that you have in step one will inform how you go about saying, okay, I need to, I want to do this. I want to develop single family houses in Lexington. How am I going to go about that? So then you'll eventually, once you've developed those systems of brokers sending you deals, brokers who have experience in this area, and you have your off market systems you'll start getting deals sent to you. And at that stage, you want to do modeling what a development will look like, what we call underwriting. And underwriting really is, 
it's pretty simple when you you know you can get very complicated with it, um, especially when you're looking at modeling ground up rental developments. But to de define it in a simple way is you have costs, your acquisition of the property, your soft costs involved with development, like your attorney fees, your interest, all those sort of costs, and then your hard costs directly involved with construction. And simply, you want to make sure that you're making profit on the, the deal. And the level of profit you need to make is up to you, and importantly, up to the people who finance your project, your investors and your lenders. So typically, a developer will have in mind you know, what sort of equity multiple, what sort of internal rate of return do I want to hit on a project? And that will inform, OK, I can pay this amount for this land. Um, kind of want to work backwards and a lot of times you know we might see properties on the open market we underwrote it we analyzed it and the price is off but we just submit an offer at the price that works for us so once you've found a deal that you've, you've underwritten you've analyzed and it looks good and you, you submit an offer on that deal and say that the seller accepts it what's that offer going to look like what's that contract going to look like this is a very important uh, and it's related to the next step is entitlement so a lot of the deals that we do um, we're not just buying a parcel in a single family zone where you're allowed to by the letter of the law build a single family a lot of times we're building something larger and a little bit different than what the zoning code the laws that govern what you're allowed to develop says you can build we need to get special permission so the, this dichotomy, you have what are called we call buy right projects, where you just you look up the zoning code and you just simply follow the letter of the law, and you just follow it, and that we call it buy right because you're allowed to buy the right of the law, just develop that way. But often those projects are not when you're pursuing a larger project or you want to add additional value, you're often getting special permission from the local municipal government. Uh, to do something a little bit different than the zoning code requires. So I'll give you an example of a project we did um, a couple years ago earlier on in our career. We looked at uh, a property in a two-family zone, but we noticed that there were larger buildings going up in that neighborhood. There was precedent that the government had given some developers permission to build a little bit larger than what the law said. So we thought, why don't we do that here? Because that law is about double the size of the other lots on the street. So we, even though the, the law said you can do two units, we actually got seven units approved. And just adding that value uh, makes for a much more profitable project than if we had tried to build two units. Uh, so the entitlement process is very important. And once you get into larger projects, um, we're doing a 32 unit, pro pro uh, 32 unit project in Brighton right now. A project like that typically will need some sort of special permission um, to get approved. You won't be able to just do that by right. And one thing I should mention uh, related to point two in your acquisition, one thing we'll typically do when we have to entitle deals, we need the special permission. How do we do that without taking on a lot of risk? We don't want to just buy that property without knowing that the government has approved it. So what we usually do is we um, we'll submit an offer with an entitlement or a zoning contingency. And so that contingency will just say, look, we'll buy your property in one year or two years from now, however long we expect this approval process to take. And you know, we'll give you a very competitive price for waiting throughout this whole process. You might have some non-refundable deposits while you're waiting. But the whole goal here is I'm not going to close on this until I get full approvals. And if I don't get the full approvals, I'm able to walk away. I don't actually have to purchase it. Now, I might have burned some money on plans and maybe some non-refundable deposits, but that's a very important thing. When you're thinking about entitlement and de-risking as a developer, contingencies are very critical. Um, and Eric will take over for the next half. So funding your deals, obviously, that's like everyone's biggest thing. Uh, how do I get the money to fund these deals? So, with development, this is kind of be depending on the type of project you're doing, you can almost split funding and entitlement. But typically, we kind of go the process Nick said on, on the projects we're doing now. So your funding is going to come with a little debt and equity, very similar to any type of you know rental property you guys are buying multi-family. 
Uh, you're going to have a debt component and an equity component. Uh, a lot of banks want to see it entitled. They want to know, okay, I'm lending on a property that you can actually do something on. Uh, you might have, uh, you know, your offer with your contingency. You might have, a, um, you know, a purchase and sale agreement. They'll kind of take some of that on and say, okay, uh, we will fund you on this contingent on, of course, closing, getting these uh, so there are different ways, you know, that we've gotten funding in the past. In our first project, it was a two-family. Uh, we saved up for four years together to make that happen. So that, you know, kind of lessened as time went on, and we kept rolling into additional projects. But one way is just save up and fund the down payment yourself, of course, maybe get 75% or so from the bank, from the lender. Uh, another way, you can partner with someone. You can put your own sweat equity in. Someone else puts up the money. If you kind of do all the work, they just provide the finance. Uh, as you get into bigger projects, a lot of times what you might deal with is like an equity group who, oh, you're telling me to move over. Sorry. Uh, like an, an equity group who, you know, if you're developing something very large, uh, even if you've saved up a lot, done a lot of projects, produced a lot of profit, you're not going to be able to put all this cash in. It's just not realistic, really. Uh, so you work with an equity group who might put in a large chunk of it, and then you're just kind of a partner. You might be the developer, the general partner who's running the whole show, but you have a percentage of this equity piece. And that's how you put, you know, an entire funding, sort of what we call it the capital stack together as you get up to bigger projects. So there are different ways to do it, but no matter what, there's gonna have to be a large cash component to the uh, investment. Um, construction, capital process, this is what everyone kind of thinks of when you're thinking of development. Um, almost the easiest part from our standpoint, because we just now, we, we hire a general contractor, an expert in the field who does it. Uh, when we first started, we did it ourselves. We self GC, and that if you're not an expert in that, that's not fun. If you're an expert in it, it's great. Uh, a lot of firms do both. You know, they develop and they have their own in-house contractor. Uh, but you know, it, it doesn't always work for us. We realized it took a lot of time away from kind of what we were better at, which was finding the deals, trying to get them closed, bringing in equity partners. Uh, so for us, the construction is its own thing. We bring in an outside party, uh, guys we've worked with in the past, maybe someone we have word of mouth reference, someone checked out their sites, walked their different jobs, made sure, okay, this is a legitimate company. These contractors have done projects with this size. So that's, that's kind of how we deal with construction. We bring in an outside general contract. But there's different ways you can do it. And this really applies from a single family up to you know, 100 years. Um, so kind of the final step, and again, this depends on what you're doing. If you're just flipping a single family, if you're building an apartment that you're going to hold on to and rent, then you kind of get to this final stage that is dependent on your business plan, what you figure you're going to do from the start. Whether it's to sell the you know, individual house, sell the units as condos, hold on to it, rent by getting it stabilized. You might say, okay, look, I'm going to get this thing stabilized in two years then sell it to an investor, the entire building, you might say, I'm gonna hold on to this thing, you know, for 10 years. So that's kind of all part of your business plan, this last stage, but no matter what, that's that's kind of where you get to. When you get the certificate of occupancy, it allows someone to inhabit this building, whatever it is you developed. So these are some things, you know, these are questions we had when we first started. These are a lot of things people ask us. Um, how do you find deals? So we started to, and this has evolved over the last six, seven years, we've created a lot of systems where, you know, at first we were just looking on MLS, we were getting deals, that was our first deal. Like I said, it was a two family, we added a third unit. Uh, so you can do that, you can use the multiple listing service, but you, you, you're probably not gonna get that many deals, especially now, it's very competitive, it's harder to get a lot of deals through that. Um, so we've created systems where we have, you know, a lot of broker contacts, we're getting deals, and this was very intentional. At first, we, we kind of said, okay, how do you do this? How do you meet people? You gotta go to things like this, meetups, and you really have to kind of use different databases, something like CoStar, even MLS, where maybe you don't wanna get your deals from there, but you wanna find brokers, agents, and just introduce yourself. Send emails, get a list of hundreds of brokers, send emails, make phone calls, meet them if you see them holding an event. And what slowly happens, we're at the point now, like organically, we're getting a lot of deals sent to us that never hit the market. And most of them we probably pass on, um, but that's just kind of the nature of, of real estate. Um, another question we hear is, 
uh, how do you fund your projects? I kind of went over that a little while ago, but that's something where if you you can save, like I said, bring in a partner. Uh, it all depends on the type of project. Uh, it's a very low risk project. It's going to be much easier probably for a bank to lend to you, you know. But no matter what, you're going to have to put probably about 25 percent in for most developments. Sometimes you get bigger, you're going to get to like 40 percent, which is where you kind of bring that equity group in. Um, but regardless, you're going to have to put some cash in, or like I said earlier, kind of your sweat equity. In some component, there has to be cash in the deal. Eric, just a quick question. Yeah. Uh, on the lead funnel that you guys created, all those leads that come in off market, you guys for consideration. Yep. Do you find yourself turning down the air deals or turning away certain opportunities for the reason that they don't make sense financially for you guys? Or is it because you just don't have the capacity to take on that next good deal? Can you give us a little insight there? Sure. What your lead yeah. funnel actually is and then how you guys decide what to take on what not to take on. Yeah, that's actually a good question. We do, we probably have turned down deals where we just didn't have the capacity in the past. We're, we're expanding, we're bringing a lot of people in to kind of help with this. Okay. So it's more so if it just doesn't make sense. And yeah. what we notice is a lot of times those deals are very overpriced, especially when they're off market because they say, okay, look, this is what I want for it. I'm not listing it. If you don't want it, I'll find someone else. Yeah. Um, so that is probably more often than we just turn it down if it doesn't make sense. We have Right. So more, more rarely you guys will turn down a good deal yeah. because you don't have a capacity. We'll pass it on sometimes. If it's a good deal, we'll pass it on. Because there's so few good, really good deals. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of times we'll just figure out how to make it work. Maybe we'll bring in another partner and try to do it with that. Maybe we're not as heavily involved. Right. Uh, Eric, what are the most common mistakes that you see people make? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Yeah. Well, and the last question is, uh, we did, again, these are just very common questions we've been asked over the years. How do you find a good contractor? And there's a lot of ways to do this. I mean, you know, you could see a project going up. A lot of times the contractor's name will be on the fence surrounding the project. Uh, but really, if you're in the industry, like all you guys are all you guys are talking with people, meeting agents, meeting other people who are somehow analogous to real estate, even if it's not construction specifically, talk with them. You'll you'll start to build a really organic network where someone's gonna know someone who knows a contractor. It's not with stuff like this, when you're putting a lot of money on the line, you're building something that people are going to live in that has to be code. You don't want to just find a contractor on Google. You know what I mean? You need to really get word of mouth. This is kind of the most important part of the construction. And you want to visit these guys, go to their sites. Okay, but so basically, you're saying referrals are the best. Referrals are the best. Are the best. Yeah. That's a much easier way to say it, yes. Yeah, okay. And then, I mean, you want to meet these guys too, and, and you don't want to just turn someone down right away, but first impressions are kind of big. We've had situations where we just, we got a bad feeling about a contractor. We didn't really have any stories that said, oh, something's off with this guy, but you know, they, they're late or they're telling you a number that doesn't really make sense. It's way less than, you know, six other guys that told you <coughs> the same thing. So just going to use a little common sense with it. Uh, but the referral aspect is, that's it. That's how we got, at this point, any contract we use, uh, even subs, if we're sometimes still doing it ourselves, all through referrals. That's it. Right. Questions? What's the average time frame before you see on our lives? Well, with, so it depends really, like condos, for example, that we do, I mean, probably construction time is around, depending on the size, like a year to two years, if the, as they get bigger. Most of our projects, prime frame is the entitlement part of the city. And since most of our stuff's in Boston, I mean, our first zoning project was six months in entitlement. Now we've had somewhere in the last couple of years that have taken like two and a half years before we had a shovel in the ground. So, yeah. So it's, it's usually two, three years before you see money. Well, and you control the property from day one, right? Sometimes. It, it's like Nick was saying about those zoning contingencies we'll put in. That's ideal. If we don't have to put anything down until we're moved. What, what kind of advice oh. would you give on the zoning? Um, <clears throat> give some advice on the zoning approvals. What was that? What kind of advice would you give around zoning approvals, getting around those? I could, I could go ahead, Nick, yeah. Yeah, so a really big thing with zoning is having a good team. So for us, that means our zoning attorney. Um, in our Boston jobs, we work with Mike Ross out of Prince of Bell, the former politician. Really good zoning attorney, uh, has a lot of good connections. 
uh, good at working with the neighbors, you know, can you come from a political background, which is often very important if you have a neighborhood games. And a lot of people are anti-development just because the nature of it, those are the only people motivated enough to show up. So there's a, there's a little um, politics involved um, with the zoning approvals. And having a really good architect is super important. Um, we often find local architects who have had success in the neighborhoods we're trying to build in. Um, you know, it might not be fair, but the, the same guy keeps getting the same job, but it helps it get approved. Yeah, quick question. So for, uh, for, for the ground up developments in your experience, uh, is it possible to get funded where you are essentially, uh, let's just say I own a lot, right? I own a lot, worth 250000 um, and the cost of the project is a million dollars and your, your requested loan cost is 75. Can I leverage the lot that I own that is worth enough of that equity you're requesting for as some kind of skin in the game and not have to bring cash to the table? Yeah, you, I mean, it depends on the lender, but in that type of example, you, you could do that. Maybe with that, you said 250 plus a million, maybe you have to put up like another 50,000. But yeah, they would, they would take that. Because a lot of times what we'll do is acquisition of the property, 25, 75, 25 on the actual land, and then the construction loan is 100% funded. Okay. So on the whole project, you're actually a better leverage than 75. No. Okay. Do you, do you think that varies from asset class to asset class, or generally everywhere? Yeah. yeah okay. That's, that's okay. They're, they're usually like residential. It's, it's typically safer, a lot of from a bank standpoint, with development. Um, so yeah, definitely. And if, sorry, one last one. Our construction loans said it'd be uh, bridged over just a short term and then you refinance into like a... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And all interest only what you're paying. Same with the acquisition of the land you get. Usually it's like a, you know, couple year bridge, interest only. So everything you pay is really just rent, renting the, the loan. And it gets really stuck draws. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Me? Yeah. Okay. Do you... Um, like the play I did, you guys are horizontal, the yes. builders are vertical. My question to you is, do you have the homeowner sometimes? I do it where I have the homeowner keep it, and I have, and I get a permit for them. But politically, they've been there for 25 years, they know everybody, and then at the end, so then I take transfer to you. Yeah, yeah. And that's, and I also use, instead of bringing the boys from New York, I bring, I find the uh, guy who did the uh, development on uh, another project here, and I know he knows all the politics. It's all politics. It's all it is. Yeah, bullshit politics, and you just bring in that attorney and that, um, uh, what do you call it? The oh, so you look surveying. at the minutes from the previous zoning board approval? Yeah, it's a great way to get the referrals and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 It's all about digging up. Well, you find it. That's the way I do it. All right. Here we go over here. Yes, we We do know about 40 Bs. I, I think, uh, I don't think you could do a 40 B in Boston. It has a lot of affordable housing stock. I think they, I think they have. We're, we're seeing some groups just head out, head out west and start using 40 Bs. Most, uh, they all have their women's I you like, can find the database and think where where each city is at. Most town, most municipalities have not reached the affordable housing uh, limit where they can basically say no to forty. Boston is one of the groups you know, that has. Um, can you explain like the timeline process, right? Like acquisitions and entitlement. Can you explain, I guess, uh, two, two items, explain how you engage the design team and then the contract push into that kind of timeline? Yeah, so right away, like when we kind of have the idea of what we want to do, we'll look at it, we'll say, okay, if it's something in Boston, or we'll say it's East Boston, where we kind of started out, we're very familiar with um, the density that would fit in over there, maybe the size of the units that might sell, if it's condos or rented. And so we'll, we'll look at it and say, okay, this is like a 6,000 square foot lot. We think maybe we could build, you know, seven or eight units based on, you know, sort of precedent around. 
um, or what we know. Um, and then right away, we'll talk to the architect. That'll be usually be our first call and say, okay, this is what we think we can do here. Can you draw up a sketch? It'll be very basic, but we'll see, okay, that, you know, maybe we'll drop it into the street view so you can kind of see how it might look around. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the first step. And then I'd say contractors, decent, decent way down the road from there. Uh, if it's a buy right project, which they're usually not, uh, you, you get them in pretty much after that and just start moving. Uh, but you really, because the design could change so many times through that zoning process, yep. you, you don't really bring in the contractor other than for basic kind of like cost. So you, you would know. take the architects, the design package, you go submit for permit? Yeah, you go, you go to the town, the municipality, you go through all whatever their process is. Right. And usually you'll have, as Nick said, many neighbors fighting you and you'll come in with whatever, 10, 20 units, maybe a result on six because of that. Uh, and then you kind of say, okay, now we know exactly what we're building. What's the cost of this? Then you bring in the contractor and kind of construction professionals. We have the engineer on early, but the architect's the first kind of guy we work with at least. And during that early process, you're, you're, you have a zoning set of architectural plans. It's not a full plan set because it's in flux and you'll wait until you're ready for that full plan set mm -hmm. before you get your contract. You can get the zoning before going to the building permit. Which yep. is where I kind of, like my thought is the contractor pulls the permit, the building permit. So Permit's your last step right before you go to show. So you're getting full again. Any other questions for these guys? Are you doing just Boston or are you doing looking yeah. around the central metro west? All around Eastern Massachusetts, we're actually looking at a pretty big deal in Rhode Island right now as well. And how do you work with, like a wholesaler who has land and stuff like that, how does that work? Um, we've never worked with a wholesaler before, it's mostly been off market and brokers sending us deals, but it, it would be no different than if a broker had a, a uh, listing and they wanted to send it to us and we'd take a look at it. And get an idea if there's something that we can do there or not and you know submit an offer or place that works for us.